Sorry. Okay. Um, as she said, and Andrea Wagner, also known as WA1GON, which is my amateur call sign, and some people have uh, changed the one to the nine, started calling me way back. <laughs> so, um, I'll try not to bore you too much. Um, you know, this is my first year as president because the club have showed their poor judgment of elected me. So <laughs> but they're going to get to correct that mistake here next month or in December. Um, a little bit about the club. The club has been in operation for about 20 so years. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long. I've been here eight years and I've uh, been actively involved with it. Uh, I'm also involved with a club down in Springdale uh, where I'm the volunteer examiner for uh, amateur radio license. So um, I'll go into more details about that. Um, but as the sign says, um, when all else fails, amateur radio works. And I will have some pretty good examples of that. Okay, what is ham radio? It's a licensed service that the FCC and the International Telegraph Union has set aside bands, which is certain frequencies for the sole use or shared use with amateur radio operators. Uh, amateur radio operators talk across town, across the county, state, nation, world, and space. Uh, a little anecdote, I was helping teach a class for new technicians and we always have someone standing by to, for the students to talk to. And one of the students asked a predictable question of, what's the father station you have actually talked to? And I was expecting to say Japan, Australia. He says, Mars. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, took part in an experiment with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with Voyager space uh, craft and bounced that amateur radio signal off of Voyager as it was going by Mars. Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was, <laughs> that just totally blew me away. <laughs> uh, and we also routinely talked to the International Space Station and uh, the space shuttle, or where it was flying. Uh, the space shuttle. Uh, every astronaut must be a licensed ham radio operator. Really? Uh, hmm. It's a strictly nonprofit. Uh, it is illegal to um, use amateur radio for um, pay. Uh, you know, even if there's a nurse or something who is using uh, for emergency stuff or a doctor, um, you know, that's strictly, you know, prohibited. Although I think they've loosened the um, laws a little bit on that, but, you know, some of the people I've talked to say, you know, they still can't do it. Um, so it's a hobby and it's a skill and it's, it's it's a service for emergency communication. And one of the examples, which I will go into greater detail later, is uh, when the planes flew into the 9-11 towers. Mm -hmm. Every piece of communication equipment that New York City had was on those towers. 
and all of a sudden nothing worked. And they called out the hams for months. In fact, I was slated to go down there because I was living up in New Hampshire at the time. And just about the time I was picking up my bags and put them in the car, um, they called and says, okay, we're shutting down operations. And that was like two months in, you know, after the event. So it's a, uh, every hurricane, tornado, you know, we're there. Um, this club in particular, uh, you may have heard of the Charity Cure bicycle race a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And we was doing the emergency communications for that race. So that was, um, and we have been doing that for, since I've been here. Uh, I usually do it because I get a t-shirt. <laughs> um, and one of the questions I usually get is, has the ham radio been replaced by cell phones and the internet? And the short answer is no. Um, because cell phones and the internet all relies on a certain amount of equipment and infrastructure to accomplish what they need. All we need is the radio and pin a 12 volt car battery to uh, talk around the world. And it's also fun, it's kind of like fishing. You know, I can't pick up my ham radio and say, I want to talk to New Zealand today. Mm -hmm. um, I might be able to talk to New Zealand, but I might not be able to. And it depends on the time of day. Uh, and I might be able to talk to New Zealand on one band, but another band would be out of the question. Uh, so it's like fishing. You know, you can either go buy fish or you can go fishing. You know, a lot of people like to fish. You know, I fish for contacts. Uh, how does amateur radio work? Uh, and I'll use amateur and ham radio here to change the way we usually call it hams. Uh, we have different mega bands. Uh, this one, uh, the v VUHF, is 50, 140 megahertz. Uh, 220 megahertz, 420 megahertz, and 902 megahertz, and it goes all the way up into the gigahertz range. Uh, very few people use those because they don't have very much range. These are like line of sight, you know, unless you can see the person you're talking to, or there's nothing in between, uh, it doesn't get very far. So we set up repeaters. We have a repeater in Centerton that's the highest place in Bendy County. Uh, it's about three miles from my house so I can almost throw a rock and hit it. Um, and we have another repeater on top of Mount Whitney. Um, and they kind of work like FRS's GRMS's that you buy at Walmart, uh, except that we get to use a lot more power. Uh, these radios, the FRS's is like a quarter of a watt. Mm -hmm. The GRMS's I think maxes out to about five watts. Uh, we can, on most bands, use 1500 watts. Mm. Wow. So, uh, the FCC gives a lot, a lot of leeway in that. The um, UHF magic, we, that's what we talked to the space station with. As I said before, all the astronauts are hams. We have about 20 satellites that we can bounce signals off of. Uh, EME is Earth, Moon, Earth, where we actually bounce a signal off the moon and we're able to talk to someone on the other 
other side of the earth. Um, and I will let you know a little uh, thing on top secret information in World War II. Mm -hmm. The Americans were using moon passes to talk to from the States to Hawaii and other ships doing moon bounces. So um, it's not something that's totally new. Here we have a picture of the space station. And the other large super band that we have uh, access to is called HF. Uh, to kind of show you the difference, uh, HF goes from you know basically one megahertz up to 30 megahertz. That's only 30 megahertz of bandwidth. Our 440 band goes from, I think it's 420 megahertz to 450 megahertz. So the uh, UHF band has more bandwidth than all the HF combined. And we're not the only service that gets to use HF. Uh, HF is used by shortwave radio stations, uh, you know, commercial stations. It's used for aircraft uh, to talk you know, when they're flying overseas and there's no uh, line of sight stations. Although that's been pretty much replaced by satellite, uh, you know, our communication satellites, uh, but you know, they still have that capability. Um, and the antennas are very large. When we're talking about frequency, as the frequency goes up, the length of the antenna goes down mm -hmm. proportionally. And um, if you're talking about, or if you take 300 and divide uh, the band into a, like a 20 meter band, you'll get 15. And the 20 meter band is like 14 megahertz. So it's not an exact figure, but it kind of gives you the you know, kind of rule of thumb. So a full wave antenna at 14 megahertz is, has to be 20 meters long. That's 60 feet or more. Uh, but you can have half wave antennas and quarter wave antennas. When you say long, is that like up off the ground or could it be? Uh, most of the time, when we're talking about HF, especially the lower, lower bands, that has the long antennas. Uh, it's usually a horizontal antenna, uh, but there's tricks that they, we do to uh, be able to make it a little bit shorter. And the farther up off the ground, these wire antennas, because all it is is a long piece of wire, uh, the better they operate at. Uh, because of the angle you know, if you take a piece of wire and it's like 15 feet off the ground, mm -hmm. most of the energy is going to go straight up. Right. If the antenna is 40 feet off the ground, the, the energy goes almost horizontal, so it reaches farther. Uh, both of them actually has you know a lot of benefits. If you have it close to the ground. It goes up and bounces off the uh, atmosphere mm -hmm. and comes back down. So you have a range of about two or three hundred miles that you can talk fairly reliably. Uh, but if you want to talk to other countries, the higher up it is, uh, the better off you are. Uh, and our lowest band that most people use is 160 meters 
And so a 160 meter antenna can be as much as 500 feet long. Um, I have my 160 meter antenna zigzagging across the pasture <laughs> over my horses. So all that matters then is the total length of the antenna. You don't have to necessarily have it all stretched out. I am told that is true. I am far from an antenna expert, but when I asked one of the club members who is a uh, antenna expert, I, I said, you know, gee, I don't have two trees that's 500 feet apart. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's like 250 feet for this antenna. Uh, can I zigzag it? He says, yeah, actually, it works better like that. Mm -hmm. I said, cool. <laughs> So, uh, each up propagation is something that we live by. So, and that allows us to talk around the world because it bounces off the atmosphere. During the day, this is what it looks like. The D layer sort of causes it to bounce. And the higher the frequency, the better it travels during daytime hours. The lower the frequency, the better it travels at nighttime. So uh, this is the method that we get to make the long range communications. And then nighttime, those layers kind of go away. And uh, so it goes farther up. And um, allows the lower frequencies to bounce off. So, you know, basically 20 meters is kind of our midpoint. Anything below that is kind of a nighttime frequency. Any band with higher frequency is kind of our daytime frequency. So that's how it works. Okay, I was talking about 9-11. Uh, we was deployed in force there. And the 9-11 attacks temporarily wiped out a lot of communication systems. That's when ham radio operators went to work. Andrew Day reports. When the towers went down, so did almost all forms of communication. That's when the ham radio operators sprang into action. Once the towers collapsed and everything went black in here, uh, people were just dumbfounded. Everybody's trying to talk at once and people pick up their cell phones couldn't get through. It was a day guys like Charlie Cargrove and Mark Phillips trained for. They communicate on amateur radios and when disaster strikes, they get messages through when no one else can. When it finally happens, you just go into automatic. You don't even think about it. The city was virtually paralyzed, and ham radios were about the only way to talk. So Charlie, Mark, and some 250 volunteers spread out, backing up the city systems 24 hours a day. Down at uh, ground zero. They got word to frantic relatives, worked at shelters, even pulled people off the streets. But they're the ones you don't see or read about. I wouldn't say that we were heroes. Uh, we were doing our job. Just being out there, the sense of being part of the community and, and just helping out. If I've got the ability and I've got the time, why not? And that's a true hero. Andrea Day, Fox 5 News. So, you know, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons that the FCC really uh, provides us with a lot of the 9-11 attacks temporarily wiped out a lot of communication system. Uh, that's why the FCC gives us a lot of leeway. Here's another slip. Communication is key right now in Puerto Rico, but without power down there, it has not been easy. However, there is just one mode of communication that has withstood the strong winds and the flooding, and that's the ham radio. And the dependable medium is headquartered 
right here in Connecticut. News 8's photojournalist Kim Mellick shows us how operators are helping save the island. Marjorie Brady message traffic from the Hurricane Maria affected areas. If you have traffic for the net or need assistance, please call in now. Last Friday, I received a phone call from Red Cross. They were looking at potentially establishing up to 500 Red Cross shelters across the island. So they came to us to see if we could assist with the communications and gather up some volunteers to deploy with their teams and their shelter teams. Twelve hours after we put out the call for volunteers in Puerto Rico, we had 350 volunteers. So by Monday afternoon, we had 50 volunteers identified over to Red Cross, vetted and processed, and now they, they just arrived there this morning in San Juan. So this is a, a, one of the basic HF or kind of a long-range communications kit. The kit is built around an HF uh, transceiver, an HF radio, which makes long-distance communications possible. And there's all the cabling and connectors that make this happen pack for power. There's antennas in the kit, VHF radios for local communications, a small tool kit so that you know the in the field, and of course all the necessary manuals to figure out how this stuff really works in a pinch. Team emergency radio net Saturn uh, calling any station in the affected area of Hurricane Maria. Some of them are military, some of them are first responders, but every one of them says, I don't care about the personal sacrifice that I have to make, there's a greater good to do here. Communication is key. So, you know, as you say, uh, you know, emergency service is sort of in our DNA, and one of the uh, things, um, or, you know, talking about this hurricane, one of the uh, club members uh, in the Springdale Club actually deployed with the Southern Baptist uh, emergency service team to Maria for about three weeks and he has some really good stories on that. That was loud. That's a, yeah. mm. uh, a watch, not a warning, but a watch. That's so, nice. if you know, don't know about BC Alert, that's uh, you know, Google it. You can have it installed on your smartphone, and you'll get a message like that anytime that uh, any type of emergency happens, and you can selectively decide which. Uh, type of emergency things you want to be notified of. That's called DC Alert? DC as in Benton County Benton Alert. County Alert. Mm -hmm. And it's available for everyone in the area. Yes. And it's really great. You know. uh, so, anyway, getting back to the privileges that we get. You know, we're, we're the only service where the users are legally able to modify our radio equipment because we do a lot of experimenting, you know, figuring out how to make things work. Um, uh, there's a type mode of communication called sped, spread spectrum uh, frequency hopping. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's used by your cell phones, uh, your Wi-Fi routers, you name it, and it's been used. Um, the person that discovered it was a ham radio operator. And her, her name was uh, uh, Heidi Lamar, the actress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, and talking about her, um, ham radio is very sexist. You know, if you're a 10-year-old male 
uh, radio operator, you have been promoted to an old man. If you're a 99 year old radio operator, you're a, a young lady. Mm. <laughs> um, anyway, we can run up to 1500 watts on most bands. There are some bands that they do put a uh, more power restriction. Um, running 1500 watts is not cheap. Um, mm. The equipment is, can be very, very expensive. Uh, so it's not something that I, I normally have a problem with. Um, we experiment with different modes, like digital modes. We have a, you know, kind of a chat, you know, mode like you would do with uh, Facebook or other chat applications that goes directly across uh, the airways. Uh, we have email service that goes directly across it. Uh, airways um, and we have digital voice we have slow scan TV we have amateur radio TV um, it's not used that much but it's you know it gives uh, uh, amateurs and who may be professional uh, uh, radio engineers a chance to test out the theories and their uh, concepts. Um, PR1B is a law that prohibits local and, local and state governments from passing laws restricting your antennas and towers and things like that. Um, you know, up in New Hampshire, we had a hand that wanted to put up three towers, 300 300, 150 feet towers, and the town says, nope. And uh, the ham took them to court, along with the amateur radio relay league, and won. And he has those three towers up today. So uh, they're very aggressive about protecting it. It doesn't cover you from, uh, you know, uh, CCR is like in a uh, in Bella Vista or you know, some other place that has you know you sign a contract uh, that you won't put up outside antennas and things like that. You know, uh, the government figures that you've done that of your own free will, and but uh, so you actually bought into that. Although there is. You know, things are trying to change it, but I'm not a big fan of changing that. You know, if you want to have towers and big antennas, don't move to a place that okay. restricts it. So CCR, is that Creedence Clearwater Revival? Community no. Covenant. <coughs> community Covenants. <laughs> and, uh, community Covenants and Restrictions. Thank you. I was trying to remember what that stood for. Um, you can also allow other people to use the equipment, uh, provided you're there to make sure that they don't do something bad. Um, you're allowed to contact anyone, anywhere. Uh, you know, if there was any hands in North Korea, we can talk to them. Uh, talk to people in Cuba, you know, regularly. I talk to people in the U Ukraine and Russia frequently. Um, and we're self policing and uh, testing. Um, you know, as I stated earlier, I'm a volunteer examiner. So um, it takes three to give a test. And if you pass the test, you know, you get your license. And we also have uh, people who have signed up to listen for uh, infringements of the rules. So, um, you know, 
we take our uh, privileges very seriously. Um, what we can't do, we can't play, uh, we can't operate for money, we can't play music, and that has been sometimes an issue. Uh, like I worked the Boston Marathon, and we had like 25 first aid stations and 25 water stations, and there was a band playing right next to where we was set up. So uh -huh. you know that caused a little bit of problems. We cannot encrypt uh, messages for the purpose of, of obscuring the messages. Uh, anyone has to be able to listen to the radio transmissions and understand or be, or be able to, if they have the proper equipment and software, to understand that anything goes out. Um, using obscene and foul language, that's another thing, gets people in trouble very quickly. Um, and of course, using it in, to aid in a crime. Uh, special privileges. Oh, I went to the room. No, I think so. I do go to the room. Uh, so, now that you know all, all there is, how do you get license? Uh, uh, do I need to know Morse code? Thank God, no. <laughs> 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 I struggled to get five words a minute, and I could never get the 13 from general. And I was so thankful when uh, they dropped the code, they first dropped the code requirement for general and above to five words a minute. And then about two or three years later, they dropped it completely. And all the older hands was saying, you know, that would be the death of ham radio. <laughs> and uh, it hasn't been the death. You know, we still have some bad apples on uh, some of the frequencies, but not very many. And they go out after them aggressively. Um, also, the other thing I should mention that you can't do on ham radio is broadcast. You know, some people think, oh, I'll get in and do a, you know, show or something like that. You know, this is for two-way communication, so you got to be talking to somebody. Um, uh, the tech and general license is 35 questions, and the actual is 50 questions. Um, the only age limit is that you have to be able to pass the test. Hmm. And there has been children as young as six and seven that has hmm. passed the test. So it's not a really hard test. It takes some studying, but it's not a real hard test. Uh, the cost of the test is $15. Um, all of the questions and answers are published. Um, what the order of the answers are not the same on the test as what's published. But that's the only difference. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and there's a great internet test like hamexam.org that will allow you to run through and uh, take the test over and over until you feel comfortable and it will even uh, learn where your weak areas is and do it. And that, you know, as an examiner, that's the way I recommend people to learn the test. You know, some of the older hymns feels like they, you should get this thick book and read through it and know everything that's in it. Forget that. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, you know, 75% of it, no matter what your interest in hand radio, won't lie to you. Because you know, if you're interested in you know the software side of it, like I am, you know, um, I'm not building an antenna, but I'm going to do it directly from the you know cookbook mm -hmm. 
and not try to uh, uh, do anything really inventive. Uh, the license itself costs nothing. It has always been that way. Uh, at one point in time, if you got a vanity call like mine, um, it was, I think, 13 maybe $15 for the license, and that was good for 10 years. Now, uh, they figured out that that was a, even <coughs> to charge that for it. So they just dropped that fee. Um, and you can find the uh, test locations at ARL.org exams and do the search uh, if you are so inclined. Uh, all three of the local clubs, uh, the Bella Vista Club, the Bidney County Club, and the Springdale Club um, does monthly testing. How many members are in the club? Mm -hmm. um, I think VCRO has like 40 paid members. Really? And uh, Bella Vista probably has about 70. They're very good at recruiting. Um, the Springdale Club, um, they probably have about 15. <laughs> um, although the Springdale Club does a lot of neat stuff. At least once a year, maybe twice a year, they do train mobile where they take the uh, uh, Arkansas, Missouri train from Springdale to uh, Van Buren and back and make contacts on the train. And um, we talked to one guy who says, I never talked to a train before. I talked to airplanes and uh, ships, and, you know, but never a train. The last time I went with them, they actually, we actually made a contact with another train. Huh. So that was kind of cool. And do these clubs have regular meetings? Uh, yes. Uh, the Bending County Club will have uh, their monthly meeting right here tonight at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the Springdale Club is the first. Uh, Monday of the month, unless that is a holiday, then it's the second in, of the uh, fire station number one in Springdale. And the Bella Vista Club has their meeting on the first Thursday at a church up in Bella Vista. And I think it's on Forest Hill Boulevard. I don't remember the name of the church. How many women do this? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have probably, you know, probably about five percent are hmm. women. Um, the Bella Vista Club has been actively recruiting um, more women. My wife is a hand, but you know, I kind of pushed her into it um, because up in New Hampshire we had snow storms and everything like that. Plus, right after 9 11, I'm going, I want to wait and get hold of you. <laughs> um, so, the technician, general, and extra, what's the difference between those? Uh, the technician is basically VUHF. And 10 meters, you know, a little bit of 10 meters. Um, and the general, you get access to all the bands, uh, but some of the bands are res restricted to certain frequencies on them. And extra, you've got everything. And what do most people go for? Uh, I think there's more technicians than, than anything else. With a technician, you can use the local repeaters. Um, you know, as I say, with our 
uh, repeater in Centerton, we can pretty much talk to anywhere in Bending County. And there's a few spots that are kind of dark. Did someone else have a question? I did. So, like you said, it's been around about 20 years, the club. Was that what the university used? Because I don't remember back then. I might be that old when my husband was in it. Did they, did they have their own club, the U of A, or? Yes, the U of A has their own club. Okay. I don't know much about it. Okay. I'm just curious if it was still around. Yes. What is the cost to get into something like that? You have to buy that equipment. Ah. Yes. Or are, you, are you going there? I am going there. Okay. Oh. What does it cost? Wow. <laughs> nice segue. Great segue. I'll thank you later. <laughs> <laughs> It ranges from $25 to $25,000 or more. Um, <coughs> the Chinese have started making these inexpensive radios. They're kind of cheap. A lot of hands don't like them, um, but they work. Um, so do you like them? I actually do. Um, they say they spatter a lot. They go too far outside of the frequency. They say what? What's that? Um, it's called splattering. And, Splatter. Yeah. Uh, and what that means is when you transmit, you have a very narrow bandwidth of frequency that you're supposed to stay within. And they say those go outside of that. Um, and that's called, called ugh, splattering. And, uh, but I've noticed. You know, no problems with them. No one's complained about them. Um, so, and they work. Um, I bought a $350 handy talkie from one of the four major brands, and I think it worked for about a year until a warranty was out, and it started having problems. Of course, of course. I bought one of these $25 ones and I've never had a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, the VHF mobile that you put in your car is somewhere between $150 and $700. And they have are between 20 and uh, 75 watts. <coughs> And they also require an antenna, but that antenna is usually around fifty dollars or less. Um, <coughs> HF is uh, where the uh, money actually starts coming in. Um, <coughs> they go from seven hundred fifty dollars up. Uh, it may require a tuner. A tuner may cost you anywhere from fifty to. Dollars, depending on whether it's automatic or not. Uh, you need a power supply that provides 12 volts. I have enough power to run the radio. Um, they're about 60 bucks. Um, and in the antenna, um, you know, you can get a wire antenna, make one, um, and they work fairly well. Actually, um, you really find someone that will loan you one. So the antenna tuner, that's a special piece of equipment just for the antenna itself, right? Correct. Yeah, that, um, because what happens is if the antenna is not in tune with the frequency that you're transmitting on, most of the signal will bounce back to your radio mm -hmm. and actually can cause damage to it. You know, most modern radios are protected against that. Yes, sir. So, 1976, I was in a trend class in high school. Tubes, transistors, and disco radio. Today, it's changed a lot. Yes. How do people that want to get into ham radio start understanding the bands, frequencies, and everything else that's involved with it? Is, is there a mentor class, or is there something that can help the individual understand it better. Back in the day, it was the, what was it, receiver that you could listen in on stuff. 
you guys have something like that where we could start um, doing this Occasionally stuff? we do have uh, classes for the technician. You know, I think we've had one general class. Uh, but every club meeting, you know, uh, you know, we try to go through one of the principles about uh, you know ham radio. So we try to do two presentations, uh, and that will, will be kind of exception because of kind of both levels, uh, one for beginners and one for more advanced hands. Um, uh, and the rest of the clubs also you know, present a program every month. So basically what you're recommending is that you get into some of the, one of the clubs, the Bell Vista, you guys, right. or Springdale. Right. And they'll probably help you out with everything instead of running out and spending $25,000 on what we don't know. <laughs> yes, and a lot of times people have loaners that will loan you equipment. Is, is there something online too? He's asking about can you find it online? Yeah, there's a gazillion YouTubes on it. YouTube, yeah, well, online. And also, just so you know, there is information available in books in your local library. And also, we have a uh, library Yeah, we have a. Uh, services on our website, like lynda.com, and other things which have instructional videos for all sorts of things, including um, how to learning some uh, information about uh, amateur radio. Lynda.com has that. Really? I'm pretty sure. I thought they stuck with computer things only, but that's good. That's good. No, they do everything. I mean, they'll do, they do everything from, you know, they do how to make friends. <laughs> and what was the name of that? It's called Lynda.com. It's a L Y N D A. It's a tutorial service, and you can log into it on our website. Okay. Uh, or Rogers, our app. Or our app. Uh, it's at RogersPublicLibrary.org. Thank you. And part of the problem is um, that this is such a big hobby. You know, there's things for everybody, and like, you know, I hate doing hard work. You know, I'm a programmer. That's all I want to do is program. So, if the hardware doesn't work, I go, somebody fix this for me. <laughs> but there's people that just live for hardware, and you know, there's the unicorns that, that like to do both. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so there's a you know whole thing. So you know, my recommendation would be Linda or uh, YouTube. You know, figure out what you want to do in ham radio, and you know if you want to you know, uh, investigate it and um, you know go down that path. You know, uh, there's things like. APRS, which is uh, Automatic Packet Reporting System, and it will send out your location uh, every X number of minutes uh, to local uh, repeaters that will you know, allow your position to be tracked on the internet. Um, uh, in fact, my wife had one, and she was going to a horse show down in uh, Virginia, and I was using one of them to track her, and I saw when she stopped for her at a hotel, and uh, instead of calling herself on them, I called the hotel, <laughs> <laughs> and her assistant says, "How did he know where, where we were stopping at? <laughs> you know, we picked out you know. <laughs> It's good in there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but there's always an off switch. <laughs> okay, um, what if you want to listen? You know, you know, a lot of people don't want to listen. Um, be, sh be careful of shortwave radios. Uh, most don't have a single sideband, which is a mode that hams have, or use, you know, primarily on the HF frequency. Um, and usually they're not very good. Um, 
Uh, you still need a fairly good antenna to get good reception. There's what is now called a software defined radios. Uh, and to me, that's the middle of the road. And they run anywhere from uh, $25. SDR play is in the middle of the room, and this is what it looks like. Yeah. It plugs into the computer, and, um, and it covers almost all the frequencies that you would ever want uh, here. And where did I get help? Uh, the three. Oh, there's the church. Um, uh, Highland Christian Church is where Bell lives. All three clubs are really good clubs. Um, and Arcane meets at um, the. That's the uh, American Radio Relay Club, our league. Uh, it's sort of the master uh, organization for ham radio. Uh, you know, it's a national and international thing. Uh, and I think all I think all the clubs are affiliated in one way or another. The other ones that actually is our lays on between the FCC and the testers. And so that's basically it. Uh, is there enough time for me to do a short demo? Absolutely. Sure. sure. Okay, I will. Into your computer? Pardon? That device hooks into your computer? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's called software defined because if you buy a normal radio, all the decoding, you know, changing from the signal that comes off the air to you know, like AM or FM or single side band is built into the radio. All you get is the audio out. With software defined radio, all it does is get the signal off the air and sends it to your computer and the computer actually does all the uh, coding and stuff.
Sorry, I'm how much you're using is a whole lot.
Australia is uh, I think it's VK. Germany, or not Germany, uh, England is G or M. Uh, Japan is J A or you know, I'm not sure how much of the J's they have. And surprisingly enough, Japan has like one and a half billion <laughs> ham radio operators. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> 